Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the CDL Podcast channel. Uh, in this episode today, we are going to be talking about the first CDL major, uh, as well as some other recent happenings in the CDL. Um, please be sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy this video. Uh, we're on the road to 300 subs. Uh, I'm pretty excited to get into this one today because it's obviously like our first reaction to a true major, a true event, other than just some regular season matches like we've had this year. Um, sorry this one's a little late. I've been super busy with school and stuff. It's my last semester finishing up school here, so things are kind of um, busy preparing for life after school and stuff. But I'm excited to get this one out to you. Uh, it is Wednesday, so I mean it's uh, at least relatively recent as to when the event just ended. It gave me a little time to gather my thoughts a little bit, and I'm recording this about an hour or two uh, after the whole Methods news dropped, so that gave me something else to talk about here. You guys know I'm a pretty big uh, Methods fan, so without further ado, we're going to get in and talk about a little bit of CDL news to start it out. Uh, and then probably kick it off into a little bit of reactions for each team and what happened to them at the major and then probably follow up with just a little bit of thoughts on some other random things and then edit out the video so it's not too long but it does give a little bit of my thoughts on each team. Um, so first, yeah, we're going to start out with some news. Uh, obviously, you guys know I'm a pretty big Methods fan, one of my favorite players in the league along with guys like Kenny Hook. Uh, I kind of like formal a lot too. Those are kind of some of my players I really like. Um, but we're going to start off with the Methods news. I just saw less than a few hours ago, uh, Methods has apparently been benched for Toronto. I'm assuming, I don't think, I mean, as of when I started recording this video, I made sure to check up on like Toronto's Twitter and like Twitter and stuff. But as of me starting this video, they haven't announced the replacement, but I'm assuming it is Insight, I believe, who is their sub. I believe he uses an AR a lot of times. I know he was on that Singularity team. Uh, that was at my first ever event I was at in BO4 Champs. Uh, him and Kleenex kind of took over with like bids and those guys um, and had that crazy Champs run for an AM team. Uh, so I would have to assume if Insight's being subbed in to be their main AR, I would think that Kleenex probably got in Toronto's ear or something. And since Insight was his teammate on Singularity uh, at BO4 Champs and they broke out there together, uh, he probably got in their ear and wanted him in. I will say that for some reason, when I saw that they picked up Insight this offseason, uh, and I knew he was like an AR player or liked to use the AR or whatever, or at least I think he does. Um, I don't know too much about the European AM scene, um, but I believe he's like kind of an AR heavy player. I kind of saw the writing on the wall for Methods um, because you've got a European coach in Marky e. B, you've got Bance, who's from the EU, and you've got Kleenex uh, and Cami, who are both EU players. And then you've got Methods, the lone NA player, um, kind of the main AR when Insight's an AR and stuff, and he's also European. Um, I kind of saw the writing on the wall that, like, if they struggled at all, Methods was instantly getting subbed out for Insight. It was kind of a weird sub pickup. Uh, when you'd think, like, usually your main AR is pretty established and you think you're going to keep them, uh, so you usually pick up, like, a sub player or, like, a flex player for um, your substitute, so that way, like, a flex is perfect because... If there's an emergency, they could probably sub in and be the main, uh, or if they had to play a sub, uh, they could do it. So kind of like when like Seattle picked up a guy like Pander as a sub last year, he seemed like the perfect sub as like a fill-in. Like if he had a quick fill-in for a match because of an emergency, he could play an AR, he could play a sub. He's obviously not like an insane player, but he can do anything. On uh, Insight, I believe, is more of a specialized AR. So I kind of saw the writing on the wall. But if I had to give my thoughts on it, honestly, I just think it's stupid um, from multiple levels. Uh, because not only is Methods playing great this year, I mean, if you look at stats, he's like pretty similar stats to Slasher and everybody praises Slasher. Um, but he's also like the personality of their team, the face of the franchise. Uh, he's been a starter on their team since they were founded. Uh, and he's really the only guy with personality on that team. I mean, like no bash against like Cami or Kleenex or Bans, but like they don't do a whole lot in like the content, like they're in it and stuff, but like they're not like big personalities. Like Methods has a big following. He's a big personality. He's funny. Um, he's good in content and stuff like that. And he's kind of like the face of their team. And even when, like, they've had all the controversy surrounding them with, like, obviously, like, the whole Looney and Brack situation and stuff, and um, I guess we don't know the full side of that story, but it doesn't seem like those players were treated very well by the org. Methods, like, still stuck with them and, like, seemed to always talk good about them. So he's always talked good about them, and then they just do him dirty like this. Uh, it seems weird. I just... I don't know. I just this is what I can't stand about roster changes. Sometimes is Toronto has been building this chemistry with this team since they put it together in MW. They made all those random roster changes in MW, settled on one team at the end of the year, and they looked amazing. And the, those last few months of the year in MW, uh, they should have been in the winners' finals at champs and had a chance to finish top three for sure and maybe even win it all um, in Modern Warfare. And then they looked super good in the preseason. Uh, like, I mean, we saw them, like, I don't know, overall, like, people were saying, like, yeah, Toronto's good, they've picked up where they left off, they're gonna be a good team this year, uh, and then they had just one or two bad weeks, uh, where they go one and four, and they just can't seem to, like, finish a match off, even though they were playing, like, not too bad in a lot of those series, like, that one against FaZe, they could have won it, 
Um, and instead of pushing through the one to two bad weeks they've had as a team, despite months and months of success, they just are like, nah, we're going to drop them. I mean, I don't even honestly care if they get better with insight because honestly, they could get better with him because I mean, they were one and four, they finished like top eight at the tournament, top six at the tournament, whatever. They didn't play that well. Um, so it'd be pretty hard to go down from where they were. Uh, but it just doesn't make any sense to just drop the face of your franchise after a couple bad weeks. Something else had to have been going on here. Like the players were unhappy playing with methods and didn't want to play with them again this year or something. There has to be some kind of something else behind this. But overall, it's just a dumb, stupid move um, from a player standpoint because he's playing well and he's a good main AR. Um, and from a business standpoint, and let's be honest, we all know who the worst player on Toronto is. Uh, you can infer that one on who they maybe should have picked somebody up for if they wanted to make a roster change. I don't think they should have dropped that player that should not be named, um, who's clearly the worst player on their team. But if you were going to drop somebody, why would you not try to pick up a sub and replace that man? Um, shouldn't have let Classic go in the first place. Uh, but that's the end of the rant on Toronto. I'm pretty pissed that Methods got dropped because it makes no sense from a COD standpoint or a business standpoint. And if it doesn't make sense from either of the two standpoints you should really be looking at, uh, then why would you do it? Um, but yeah, end of the rant there. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about um, was the CDL and how they had like their player of the stage or whatever player of stage one. And I see the reasoning for it being simp if you combine the major and uh, and like the regular season because simp was awesome. He was amazing. He was probably number two in my mind for the regular season um, like player of the stage. Uh, and then obviously they win the major and since he was like the best player on their team during the regular season um, And then they win the major. It's like yeah simp deserves to be probably player of the entire um, Stage one including the major and regular season, but I just disagree with the way it was given out I feel as though there should be like a regular season player of the stage uh, For those like five matches like there should be a regular season stage one player of the of the stage or whatever you want to call it for those five regular season matches leading up to the major and then there should be like a major mvp or a playoffs mvp for that just like how like last year um for regular season the mvp was shotzi uh but then at champs Krim was the mvp so just like in any sport like uh in any sport like basketball i'm a bucks fan Giannis, um deservingly i don't care what anybody says wins the mvp um back to back years but obviously the bucks don't win the finals so he doesn't win finals mvp and that's clear um there's a separation so like last year Giannis wins regular season mvp the bucks fall short and lebron wins finals mvp or like it's not the exact same because lebron doesn't win that for the entirety of the playoffs it's just for the finals but something like that like in every sport there's a regular season mvp and a super bowl mvp um in football same thing in baseball regular season in each um conference and then there's a world series mvp it should be something like that there should be a regular season stage mvp and then a major of the stage mvp in my opinion um so i'm gonna give what i personally thought should have uh like what i think should have happened if they had that uh i think the player of the stage for that regular season has to be hook i don't even think it's close um simp we kind of expect this out of but hook i mean he's always been a great player um, but like last year he was more thrust into like an OBJ and like dirty work role. And then all of a sudden this year he's taken over as the star of their team. I mean, he's better than Shotzi this year so far, um, which is saying something because Shotzi was our MVP last year and our rookie of the year. Um, so personally for me, the regular season MVP of stage one has to be Hook. We all call him the best player in the game leading up to the major. Um, so he was clearly the player of stage one. I mean, his stats were nuts. Everybody was unanimously calling him the best player in the game. So I don't see how he couldn't be. Um, I mean, I do see how Simp is um, the player since they base it off the entire stage um, and combine the major in the regular season. But I'm saying if I was just going with the regular season MVP for this first stage, it's Hook. And then um, the player of the stage one major or player of the playoffs for me is BZ. Um, I think the impact he had on the map was ridiculous. He was getting like constant first bloods. He was sliding in, getting those first kills. You know how I feel about BZ. I think he might be the best player in the world. I think he's certainly the most impactful player in the world. Um, but overall, I just believe that the impact he had on the map, getting first bloods and just making plays was absolutely ridiculous. So he was the player of the playoffs for me. And then who could have been the player of the, uh, regular season, but honestly, overall simp was so good in both. So I can see the logic, like I said, but, uh, I think we're going to make this a regular segment in each post major podcast. So, um, what I believe we have major for stage two, three, four, and five left. So four of them left, um, so I think in each uh, podcast following the major, we'll do a segment where we give a regular season MVP for that stage and then a playoff MVP. Um, just because it seems like someone from the winning team is always going to get it for the whole stage. Like, let's say FaZe wins the, wins the next one. Simper Abizi is probably going to get it again since they're the winning team. But I think it's more fun to kind of like give some shine to somebody who's the regular season MVP because they may not always be on the winning team. Um And like, let's say some random team, like let's say New York would have made the run, uh, to win it all in this tournament well nobody on their team probably deserves regular season uh mvp since they didn't finish as high but like 
obviously one of them deserves the playoff MVP since they won. So like Clay would have got that or something or Diamond. Um, but yeah, that's going to do that. And then as a precursor to my thoughts here that I'm about to give on my teams following the major, um, recently the pros have GA'd the XM4, it seems like, and then they've GA'd a bunch of attachments on the AK-74U. I personally think this is really stupid, um, but it could obviously change where teams stand drastically because if FaZe was super good in this meta and the meta changes, maybe they'll get worse. Or maybe there's certain teams, like I could see Minnesota getting better in this meta, that with the XM4 banned... Um, and attachments being banned on the 74U to make it less like an AR and more like a sub. Um, this could change where teams stand drastically in the meta. So I'm basing my thoughts on the current meta as we stand and um, like as we stand at this tournament. My thoughts are on how teams played in this current meta um, because we'll have to wait to see what the new meta even looks like with the XM4 gone. I've seen pros have been screaming with the QBZ and just um, people have been using the Bullfrog and I saw some people were trying to use like just random guns all over the place, uh, like random ARs, random subs are being used and stuff. So, I mean, we'll have to see what the new meta even looks like before we can really determine how teams look in it, because it may make some teams way better and may make some way worse. Like if Dash, he's forced to use a sub all the time uh, now, and there's only one AR on the map, that make, might make Optic a little worse, because Dash, he obviously prefers the AR and stuff. But before we get ahead of ourselves, we're looking at these teams uh, in the current meta, so it just has a precursor, so you're not saying, well, this meta might change this team, so how could you say they're this good? I'm just kind of ignoring the meta for now until we kind of get a more established uh, feeling of what it was, if that makes sense. All right, so on to the individual thoughts for each team in the major. We're going to do like we normally do. Instead of going over each individual match, since there were so many, we're going to kind of start from the teams that were eliminated first, give some thoughts on them all the way up to the top. So the first team, I mean, we're just going to do them in pairs of two because obviously like Surge and Ravens were eliminated at the same time. So when I say first team eliminated, I mean, that doesn't really mean anything. They were eliminated together. So Ravens got eliminated right away. Um, top 12 or whatever you want to call it, 9 through 12. They got beat 3-2. But honestly, their performance was somewhat impressive since they had to sub in Zed last minute due to, I think it was some family issues for Alex. Obviously wishing Alex the best. Hope is nothing too serious with his family. I didn't exactly hear what was going on. Obviously, if it's a family issue, it's completely up to him to... Uh, disclose it to us he has no um no necessity to disclose any family issues or anything that's going on to any of the public that's completely up to them um but i hope whatever is going on gets sorted out hope he can get back soon hope it's nothing serious uh obviously any situation like that where a player is having family issues comes before cod i mean any kind of family thing or any kind of personal issue is obviously much more important than a career um so i hope they get that figured out i hope everything goes well for them um, so obviously my thoughts are out to Alex. Hopefully everything gets sorted out soon. Um, but London has just been through it all this year, man. Uh, with obviously that horrible situation going on with Alex, he was unable to play, uh, zero, uh, not being able to play because of the visa issues, losing Alex and zero. I mean, you could argue that going into the year, those are maybe the two players you're looking at to be their two best players. Um, and they had to sub in Zed last minute and Zed is by no means a bad player. I actually think Zed could possibly deserve a spot in the league and i hope if we expand the 16 teams he has a spot because i mean in bo4 he was solid and uh in mw he was a solid player he's just kind of like one of those entry annoying players um and honestly they probably should have won this match they threw so many rounds in that map five against toronto um that they should have probably won it so i mean i just hope they can figure something out soon with their roster if zed's like permanent on their roster or whatever uh, or if alex is coming back soon i'm not really sure i hope they can just figure something out and find some success because it sucks to see a team like if they had their full roster to start the year i don't think they'd be a top team but i think they'd be competitive so it just sucks to see um a team not only um go through like so much turmoil with their roster that is pretty much out of their control but it just sucks to see a team struggle so bad of players that i really would like to see succeed and that london fan base is just awesome i mean i know like some of the guys i message that listen to the podcast and stuff are from the uk and like I mean, you guys are crazy awesome fans. I just wish you guys could have a team um, that would play better. Obviously, they made some questionable roster moves in the offseason, but I hope London figures it out because the fans in London are awesome, and it's the league's just more fun when London's good because the fans are crazy and they just make things more exciting. Uh, and the other team that was eliminated with them was Seattle. Uh, they bowed out early. I just don't see a way this team can compete at a high level unless something drastic changes. Uh, Looney and Pristini actually weren't awful in that series, uh, but they still lost. And Octane isn't just playing at the normal Octane level that we see where he's like a top, top AR. He's just, I don't know, he's not playing at that level right now. I don't know if maybe this game just doesn't suit him well or if he's kind of lacking motivation or just kind of down because it seems like it's another year of struggling and stuff, which, I mean, as a as a competitor, that can weigh on you. If your team just sucks for back-to-back -back years, it can probably just kind of be a lot on you and just kind of get down on it. But I just feel like the talent level of this team is a bit lower since Gunless and Octane aren't in their typical, like, tip-top form, I guess you could say. Um, 
I think if they were able to hit this typical format they normally do where Gunless is a top 5 flex and Octane's a top AR, they could really compete with teams. But unfortunately, I just think they're going to need to pick up a sub who can take over more. Uh, I do think Looney and Pristini both belong in the league, but they're both more like complementary subs, not main slayers that you kind of need nowadays in a sub. So I feel like they need to be split up. I Like I said, I do think they both are players that belong on starting rosters. It's just I don't think they belong together. I just think they're both like more meant to be like how Pristini um, was with like Simp and Abizi. Obviously, Simp and Abizi, they anybody can compliment cause, them because they're so good, but like with him flying in and kind of like making a play and then having those guys clean up, I feel like he needs to be paired with somebody like a Envoy or like a Simp or like a Hook or a Shotzi or uh, somebody like that, like a Kleenex even. Like somebody who's more of like a superstar slaying power. So like he can kind of be like the gap filler and like slide in and pick up some kills and then like have that guy come in after him. He's more of like a complimentary sub rather than a main sub. And so is Looney. Um, and this is completely different than what I said in like the whole Toronto methods like rant as well because like I know I said I don't like when roster changes just happen out of the blue so quickly before getting a chance. But I mean, dating all the way back to last year with Seattle, it was obviously a completely different roster, but they struggled so much. And now you come into this year, you're looking to have a bounce back season since you were the worst team in the league last year. And once again, you're like the worst team in the league, maybe besides London. Um, so I don't know. I just feel like Looney and Pristini both belong in the league as starters. I'm not saying they don't because I know people will grill me if I say they don't belong as starters. I do believe they both are starters. It's just, I just don't feel like they're a complimentary sub duo. I just think this team needs like more of a slayer. Maybe John's that guy. Once again, maybe you go Looney and John or Looney or I mean, Pristini and John, you drop one of those two, in my opinion, uh, for like John or a better slaying sub or something like that. Obviously, I don't know. I still do think that if Gunless and Octane hit form, I think that makes the map easier for Looney and Pristini, and I do see a way this team could like crack into the middle of the pack um, and justify keeping the roster together, but I wouldn't mind seeing a change on the subs. Uh, and maybe, who knows, maybe this new meta, um, getting like Gunless on a true flex roll if there is one, maybe that'll help them a lot. You never know. Um, but then that next uh, next team and like group of teams that were eliminated, first we'll go with uh, Minnesota was the next one. Uh, they lost their first match to Toronto 3-2. I was honestly pretty disappointed in this, uh, especially since it went game five, like I said, and we're saying that Minnesota may be the best search team in the game, uh, and then they lose to Toronto in that search. And I'm not willing to necessarily write them off yet because they have a ton of talent, but I would love to see Priest to be more consistent and kind of be a superstar for the team. And oddly enough, I think with this meta switch, I knew I said I didn't want to talk about it much, but this is the one team I wanted to mention it with. With these new GAs, I do think they could get better. If there's like a slower AR like the Krig that is like a true, um, like, kind of fleshed out main AR role. Uh, I think that benefits accuracy a ton because where have we seen him be the most successful? World War II where there was like a true slow main AR role. Uh, and then like a defined flex role I feel like helps Major Maniac because he was so good on the Maddox and just like a good flex player. And then with Attach and Priesta on more true subs that aren't playing like ARs like the 74U kind of currently does. I just feel like, I don't know, I just feel like this team fits into that meta more and they could be really good. Um, so like I said, I'm really disappointed. Uh, they're a team that should be competing for top six based on the talent in the roster. And then they obviously lost their first match. I'd like to see them be better. I just think it comes down to Priesta being more consistent for this team. I feel like Attach is pretty darn good at this game. And I feel like Major Maniac and Accuracy are pretty good. I just feel like Priesta is a, obviously he's an amazing player, but I just feel like he needs to find his, his comfort in this game and then they'll be a lot better. They'll be fine. Next team that fell in the same grouping was Paris. Uh, they fell 3-1 to Florida, and I know they lost this, but I mean, I've just been kind of on the Paris hype train all year early in the preseason. I ranked them pretty high in my power rankings and stuff, and I know they lost this match and stuff, and they didn't win a single match in this tournament, um, but this almost gives me hope for them going forward. I think they honestly could have won the Series 3-0, all the maps they could have won, um, but this just, this just gives me hope because Fire started to play extremely well in this series, and he struggled tremendously, in my opinion, during a lot of the stage. Um, he looked nervous in that phase match in the game five when he punched instead of just shot simp when he was one shot. Um, that would have won that in the game, I believe, if he would have gotten that kill. I, I mean, I know it wouldn't have ended the game right there, but I think that the momentum would have been on their side. They would have won that game five search and beat phase, and who knows what goes on from there. Um, but I do think that Fire started to play a lot better in this series. Uh, and with him struggling during a lot of the regular season, like I said, him looking good in this match is an important step for this team because I do believe Aqua, Scraps, and Classic have all been playing at an extremely high level. So if they can keep their high level up um, of their current play while Fire keeps improving, I think they're going to keep getting better. I don't think there's any need to panic for this team or think about roster changes. I think that honestly, if 
Like those three veterans, Aqua Scraps, Classic, like I said, keep up this high level of play and Fire keeps improving and kind of like step into a role of being a very good player. I actually think this team is dangerous and can start to crack like some top eight, top six finishes and maybe make some runs. I still think that on any given day, this team could beat anybody. I mean, we saw that. They probably should have beaten FaZe in the regular season. Uh, and then next, Toronto was eliminated. Um... In this like next round of state uh, of this like uh, of the tournament, sorry, um, and I honestly don't have much to say about them since they have a roster change undergoing. Uh, they showed life beating London and Minnesota, and then they got three would by LA Thieves, and then they decided to drop methods. What a smart decision! Not um, they might get better because it's hard to be worse than one and four, obviously. But I think they would have gotten better with methods uh, if they would have just stuck it out. And like I said, dropping the face of your brand is stupid. Nothing else to say there. Um, I will say it might seem a little skewed uh, because they were 1-4 in the regular season. They won two matches in the major and then got knocked out 3-0 by LA Thieves. So, like, yes, they're probably going to get better with Insight because it's hard to be much worse than 1-4, especially when you have talent like Cami and Kleenex on your team. Um, but I do think it's going to be probably attributed to, like, well, wow, Methods was the issue a lot more than it actually is. Because, like, yes, obviously, they're probably going to be better this year uh, than 1-4 and four each stage. They're going to, like, pick up some more wins. But that's probably just going to be due to them learning the game better, not Methods being the issue, uh, if that makes sense. But anyways, enough with Toronto. It's hard to really say anything about their future considering they dropped the face of their franchise um, for an amp player. But uh, the other team here eliminated in this little section of the tournament was Florida. Slacked and Skies showed some life finally, which was nice to see. Awakening was disgusting in this tournament. He looked like one of the best players in the game. Um, maybe the best search and destroy player in the game currently. Uh, and overall, I just feel like this weekend was a good side for them. Kind of like this section is almost like a trending up, trending down section if you've ever seen that in any sports shows. Um, but to me, they're trending up. I feel like this weekend was a good sign. Uh, and obviously, they would have liked to get further in the tournament. Um, they have a talented team. But Awakening and Neptune continue to prove they're great and some of the best players in the game currently. And then Skies and Slack finally show that life, like I said. Um, to me, Skies and Slack need to become more consistent, like I said in the last episode. Um, but if Skies can, obviously, he's not going to be able to hit that like insane play he had against, I believe it was Paris, uh, where he just was disgusting. Um, but... I believe he'll kind of get to that more consistent level he's normally at. And then Slack usually always seems to pick it up as games go on later. So if he can get to like a little bit more of that consistency that we saw this weekend, I think they'll be cracking like top six pretty consistently with chances to make a run. Because, I mean, Awakening and Neptune are disgusting in this game. Uh, I have faith in Skies to become more consistent like we saw Flashes this weekend. And I also have faith in Slack to become more consistent in the Flashes we saw this weekend. So I do believe pretty soon this team is trending upward and could be cracking the top six. Uh, like, I mean, I think they might be top six now, but they're cracking the top six consistently is what I'm saying. Uh, and the next team to bow out was LAG, LA Gorillas. Uh, honestly, a pretty good weekend from them uh, that showed they are about where we thought they were. Or they are who we thought they were. Um, little Romeo Cornell action for any of you that get that sports reference. I believe it was Romeo Cornell. I hope I wasn't wrong on that. <laughs> um, but uh, they have upset potential. Um Actually, that wasn't Romeo Cornell. Was that Herm Edwards? Oh my god, I don't know what I'm saying. I think that was Herm Edwards. Just kidding. Ignore that. Any sports fans, I'm losing my mind. Um, but they do have upset potential LAG, as we saw, and the impressive 3-0 versus LA Thieves. Uh, however, when they face the best and uh, hottest teams in the game in Atlanta and New York subliners, respectively, uh, they got handled pretty easily. Um, it seems like this team, uh, or this will be their identity all year, a team that can kind of beat anybody. Um, but then once... Uh, or they can be like any top middle of the pack teams like LA Thieves who are like towards the top of the middle. Um, but then if they run into like the best team like Atlanta when they're hot, they'll get destroyed. Or the hottest team um, right now like New York Subliners, they'll get taken out pretty easily. Um, but play like this where they have potential to upset and make a little bit of runs to like top six in tournaments might be enough to find them in the top eight and qualify for champs. Um, which is all you need. All you need is a ticket in the dance. And I feel like LAG might be a team that's good enough to consistently win like two or three regular season things in the stage, sneak into the winner's bracket. And then because they sneak into the winner's bracket, they can finish like top six and we'll just slowly get enough points that they may qualify at like seventh or eighth spot for champs. And at that point, all you need is a ticket into the dance and you bring in all the stops and who knows, maybe they can make a run. So they're like that weird team. I just never feel like they're going to win a tournament but they can randomly upset anyone. So I don't know. They're just in a weird spot. They're kind of like a neutral trend for me. They're like the most middle of the pack definition of a team ever. You never think they're going to be the top team, but you always think they'll beat the bottom teams and you think they'll just like slowly play everyone close. They're just, they're just such a middle team. But I do think, I think they have like a dark horse chance to like be a lower seed at champs when maybe not a lot of people thought they would. 
Uh, then the other team who bowed out in the same position was the other LA team, LA Thieves. They lost to Optic 3-1. Kind of a disappointing weekend as they were obviously one of the teams we uh, would think going in were probably like one of the top four um, with a chance to potentially take it all. I just think a slow start against LAG did them in. They got 3 0'd by them. I mean, I think if they play that series 10 more times, um, they probably win eight of them. But LAG just happened to be the hot team that day. Um, and then they get beat by Optic later on in the loser's bracket, who's truly just a better team than them right now. There's no way around it. Um, but there's no reason to panic. TJ seems disgusting at this game. I mean, he took over in that one search and destroy. Uh, and he's usually the one I would be concerned about with consistency uh, problems. Because he, I mean, in general, in World War II, he was pretty inconsistent, despite being a really good player. And then in Black Ops 4, he was the definition of inconsistent. Um, in Modern Warfare, he was just consistently bad for a lot of the year. But he, I think that was just due to the fact that he just hated Modern Warfare, and he doesn't seem like a guy that wants to grind the game that he hates. Um, but I think slasher teams and slasher in general, along with Kenny and Temp, all seem to get better as games go on. So if TJ can keep up the consistency and not kind of do the normal up and downs that he usually does while all those guys continue improving, I think this team could be scary. I think it was just kind of a bad fluke weekend out of them. It happens. I think that lost LAG right away, just put them on the back foot, and then they were kind of just like out of it from there. But I, I still think this team has a top four potential and still might be top four. Um... And I think they're actually going to keep improving. Just that's what slasher teams tend to do. They tend to be slow starters, and then they kind of pick it up in the middle. Like, I mean, same thing happened in World War II with Rise, uh, and then kind of a little bit last year, but not as much. And in Black Ops 3, it definitely happened, where, like, slasher teams in Black Ops 4 happened too. They struggle a ton in the beginning. I mean, 100T, Black Ops 4, uh, Envy in World War II, and then he switches teams in World War II. His team becomes the best in the game on Rise. 100 Thieves becomes the best in the game in BO4 for a little bit. Black Ops 3, Envy was solid, 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 and at the end of the game, they were the best. His teams just seem to get better as the game goes on, so I have, I have high hopes for 100 Thieves as the game goes on. And then now to our top four, Optic went out next in fourth. Obviously disappointing for them because with how good they are and stuff and how good they look, they're not going to accept anything other than a W on the weekend. Um, so disappointing, especially to finish in fourth. I feel like it wouldn't have been as disappointing if they would have lost the phase in the finals or something. But, I mean, a fourth place finish for them is below what their standards are. Uh, they looked awesome against New York Subliners in that first series. They destroyed them 3-0 and then played one of the closest and most entertaining matches of the year against Dallas. I just kind of think... If they win that series against Dallas and keep that momentum going, because Dallas is a team they obviously really want to beat because of the rivalry, I think if they keep that momentum going, we would have seen them at least play FaZe close in that winner's finals. I don't know that anybody was beating FaZe this weekend, but I think they would have at least played them close and then probably made it to the finals either by beating FaZe or out of the loser's bracket. I think it's more likely that they would have lost to FaZe and then made it out of the loser's bracket, but I do think if they beat Dallas, they would have made the finals. Um, but they didn't beat Dallas. They fell in that series, and they got absolutely smoked by New York. I just feel like they were kind of down, probably, after losing an emotional match versus Dallas, uh, and New York was just red hot at the time, so they kind of ran into a buzzsaw. They were a little bit down and then ran into a hot team. Um, with Obviously, Clay always seems extra motivated to beat Optic, so that probably wasn't a factor there, uh, and he was really motivated to beat Dashy, it seems. Um, I still think Optic's a top three team. No need to panic. Dashy and Formal are a nasty AR duo. Scump and Envoy are a nasty sub duo. I think they'll be just fine. I think they'll be right back competing for a top spot in Stage 2, and I think they're going to have at least another top four finish in Stage 2 unless something crazy happens out of the blue um, but i think optic will be just fine no need to panic just a little bit of an off series uh versus dallas just really super close they lose it and then i mean i believe it went game five round 11 in that last map against dallas they lose it if they win that i think they go to top two but they don't and then they run into hot new york nothing to panic though any optic fans you know there's probably a lot of you because that's the majority of uh, the cdl fan base they're going to be just fine they'll be competing for tournaments for the rest of the year unless something crazy happens um and then next, the team that bows out in third place uh, was New York Subliners. Absolutely nothing negative to say about this team. What a weekend from them. Um, Clay was obviously awesome. Mac and Asim were great. And then Diamond Con had one hell of a tournament debut. I mean, he played out of his mind uh, for a while there. Struggled a little bit in the last match. But, I mean, at some point, the gas had to kind of run out, you would think. And probably, I mean, he's probably nervous. I mean, hell, I would have been nervous in my debut. I'm playing um, for a spot in the Grand Finals versus Crim6, like the GOAT. I mean, I'd have been nervous if I was playing uh, my first tournament ever. Um, but I hope they're able to keep this up. I love seeing new players establish themselves as pros, and it's kind of cool to see this whole like new era of players being brought up by Clay. I mean, he kind of brought up Simp and Abizi, uh, and even like Pristini and Arsides when they were like 18. He kind of was like the first one to almost like really team with them and help bring them up after they won their first event. And now you've got guys like Diamond Con, and it seems not really like as new to him, but like he's kind of stepping into his own finally as like a consistent player with Clay. 
uh, and Mac kind of stepping into consistency with Clay. It's just like, uh, I mean, and I mean, Shotzi and Illy and like all these guys that Clay has kind of molded from young players. It's kind of cool to see that's like a, it's like when you see like a um, coach kind of have like a coaching tree in other sports. It's just kind of cool to see Clay um, having all these new players to play with, and he's kind of like creating this whole new era of COD for after he leaves. It's just really cool to see. Um, so I hope New York uh, continues this, this success because it was fun to have a Cinderella team like that and a team that we didn't. I mean, we expected Dallas, Faze, and Optic to be right there in the top three. Uh, and then LA Thieves kind of had a breakout, so we expected them to be right there. And then out of nowhere, New York just comes and blows up the whole bracket, and they looked awesome. So I hope that continues. Super good weekend out of them. Interested to see what happens with Hydra now because in the beginning of the year, it seemed like whenever he could come over, he was going to start because they loved him so much. But with the team playing this well, you really can't make a roster change. And then our runner-up for the weekend was Dallas Empire. Great weekend out of them, um, beating Optic in New York. Uh, and then, obviously, they fell to FaZe uh, twice. But Hook is nuts, uh, and Krim actually played very well. Um, it's good to see Krim play well, because my one concern with this team is always like Krim on a main. I think Krim is I mean, Krim's obviously the GOAT. He's an amazing player. Um, but I just always have felt like he's a better flex than a main AR. So to see him play really good on the main is always nice. Um, However, Atlanta absolutely dominated and outclassed them, so I'm a little worried about that. Um, or, I mean, not just Dallas, anybody's ability, for that matter, to catch up with FaZe. I think that could change with the meta shift, obviously, though, if the meta kind of makes things closer between everybody. Um, they could close the gap, but I'm concerned uh, with the fact that Dallas was able to beat Optic and then look so just, like, lost against FaZe. I'm concerned that Atlanta might be just way ahead of everyone and might stay that way for a bit until people can finally catch up. Uh, and then last is our winner, Atlanta Phase. Absolutely dominant performance out of them. They 3 0 LAG, then 3 0 Dallas, then 5 2 them in the final. Um, they look literally untouchable all tournament. There was like no doubt from the moment they 3 0 Dallas in my mind that they were going to just destroy in the finals and win. Uh, and their talent, along with it seems like their preparation and knowledge of the game, um, has them so far ahead right now. And that is scary to think about. Um, I wonder if this GA and meta switch will mess with um, the dominance and how ahead they are. But. I just think the difference between this team this year and last year, I really don't think they're any more talented because, I mean, they add RCDs in and you lost Major Maniac and Priesta. I mean, you can make, you could definitely make an argument that RCDs is better than both those players, but it's not like Priesta, Major Maniac, or some slouches. Those are two top players uh, in their role. I just feel like with RJ and um, Crowder, like being the coaches, and then I can't remember who their like, analysis guy is. I'm sorry, but I know they have uh, Easy Mac. Um, he kind of bringing in the stats and allowing Crowder and RJ to kind of like analyze things. I feel like last year Crowder and RJ were probably doing like the same thing in terms of analysis, um, but when they relayed it to the players with Simp, Abizi, Selium, um, Priesta, Major Maniac, all those players are young and have never really been an IGL. So I feel like when they had these fundamentals that they preached last year and these kind of like tactics that they try to get the, them to use in game, they would start the game using them probably. But then as things kind of broke down and it was like 220 to 220 in a hard point, they would kind of get panicked. Uh, comms would get really fast and they would just like kind of lose those fundamentals in a way, if that makes sense. But now I feel like with our city, I mean, that's not saying those players are stupid because those play, I mean, those players have won how many events? There's a lot of world champions uh, between like Simp and BZ and stuff. I mean, they clearly know what they're doing. They're smart players, but I feel like they just aren't used to that IGL role. So it was hard for them to slow down things and really make sure they were using those fundamentals. But now I think RJ and Crowder and Easy Mac can use those stats and those coaching techniques, relay them to RCDs, and then in-game, when things start to get fast, like we heard in a lot of the listens in RC saying, slow down, the comms are getting too frantic, we got to do this, we got to do this, and this is what, where we need to be, this is where you need to be, just slow down and call out more calm. And then you could tell, like right after you said that, it wasn't like a fighting thing, it was like, okay, yeah, he's right, we are calling out too fast, we slowed down. So I just think having RCDs in the game is more of a leader, more a mature player, um, a guy that can slow down the game for those guys uh, and kind of like bringing in almost like bringing Crowder's voice because they all seem to trust Crowder. They're like bringing Crowder's voice into the game more through RCDs. And I just feel like that helps their fundamentals and just their overall smarts as a team. And I think that's what we're seeing. Their talent was finally able to meet up with just smarter play. And boy, is it scary. I mean, they, if they keep playing like that, they could sweep the tournaments on the year. Um, but yeah, like I said, precursor to all those teams, all this could change with the GA, but I mean, obviously, we're not going to try to predict things. We're going to go based on what we saw. And then once we see the GA start to play out and how the meta is shifting, we'll kind of start to reorder teams in that way. But I don't see a way that phase really drops off the top spot for a while. Um, but with all those thoughts in for the teams in the major, let's grab, uh, let's get into our power rankings a little bit following the major. And as a precursor to this little segment as well, um, so I don't get yelled at in the comments, 
The 6 through 10 spots in the power rankings is honestly just a giant coin flip to me. Um, so at this point, it's just kind of my opinion on where I think their stock is at, like who I think has the highest potential to make a run right now, because honestly, I feel like 1 through 4 or 1 through 5 is pretty established, and I think 11 and 12 are pretty obvious. I just think 6 through 10 is just an absolute coin flip of where you want to put people. And then I'm a little upset at one franchise, so I put them towards the bottom. I think you guys can figure out who that is. Um, so I just order them in terms of where their stock is right now, uh, in my opinion. Uh, but we're going to start at the bottom and then go to the top like we normally do. Uh, I think 12 and 11 are going to be pretty obvious. 12, we've got London Royal Ravens, and 11, we've got Surge. To me, they're kind of in a tier of their own at the bottom because I just think they have the smallest upset upset potential to maybe take a match, but I just don't see them making much more of a run. And I have Seattle ahead of London because I think they just have a little bit more potential for upsets, um, obviously because they've won a match and London hasn't. Um, and then at 10, I've got Toronto Ultra. I mean, honestly, I think you could put them ahead of LAG, Minnesota, whatever you want. But... Like I said, I think 6 through 10 are all pretty even in my mind right now, and I'm just upset with the fact that they drop methods. We don't know what the roster is going to look like, so I'm putting them at 10. Uh, and honestly, I do think 6 through 10 is all in the same boat in terms of a tier. I think they're teams that are all can beat anybody on any given day, but we don't really... Th like I don't know. I guess I'll put 9 and 10 in their own tier. Toronto and then 9, I have LAG. Uh, I think I'm going to make them in their own tier as well, like a kind of a tier above Seattle and London, but I'm going to say that those are teams that I think have potential to beat anybody on any given day, but I really think their potential with Toronto dropping methods and stuff, at least for the short term, kind of bottoms out at like a top six finish or something, but I do think they're both solid teams. I do think Toronto is probably going to still be solid without methods, just upset with the drop. Uh, and then at eight, I have Minnesota Rocker um, starting their own tier here with seven and six. Uh, I have them at eight just because They've been so bad at hard points. They're like the worst hard point team in the game based on uh, win rate. And I just think that their search can only carry them for so long because like we saw, we saw them lose that map five to Toronto in the tournament to knock them out. Uh, I have them in the eight spot just because right now I think I'd take Paris and Mutineers um, for more upsets. So I have them in eight, but they are in a tier with Paris and Mutineers for me. So that, I mean, that shouldn't tell you where I'm going. Seven, I have Paris and six, I have Mutineers. Um, and this is a whole new tier for me. I think that bottom tier is Surge and Royal Ravens. The next tier up is Ultra and LAG. And then the next tier up is uh, Rocker, Legion, and then Mutineers from bottom to top. I think they are in that tier where like, I really think they're trending up possibly. Um, maybe not Rocker, but for sure Paris and Florida. Uh, I think they are teams that couldn't beat anybody on any given day. And I really think they have a chance uh, to crack the top six in the next major and maybe even make a run further. I think they're all super talented and I think they're trending upward. Uh, and then starting kind of the next tier, uh, I think, honestly, I'd like to put two through five in the same tier just because I don't think that much separates them. Uh, I could see maybe splitting four and five with two and three, but I'm going to just put five through two in the same tier. So five, I have LA Thieves. Um, I do think you could put them ahead of New York, but just because of the fact that New York beat them uh, on the weekend and New York was red hot and seems to be trending upward, I'm going to put them ahead of LA Thieves um, at four, but I have LA Thieves at five and New York Subliners at four. Uh, and I do think that both of them are kind of in the same tier. They're teams that can beat anybody, are going to compete at every major, could potentially win. Uh, and then at three, I have Chicago Optic and two, Dallas Empire. They're kind of in um, a tier with New York and LA Thieves. Once again, teams that can absolutely beat anybody on any given weekend could go in and win the tournament or go undefeated. But I just think they're a little bit below my number one team, and that's FaZe. I think FaZe is on a tier of their own right now. I mean, that was pretty obvious. Um, I would say FaZe is the favorite to win every match they're in. Obviously, it could be anybody, and they should be the favorite to win every tournament from here on out unless the meta shift changes things. Um, so then going down from top to bottom, uh, 1 through 12 in my power rankings, to just reiterate it, I've got FaZe, Empire, uh, Chicago Optic, New York Subliners, LA Thieves, Florida Mutineers, Paris Legion, Minnesota Rocker, LAG, Toronto Ultra, uh, Seattle Surge, and London Royal Ravens. Like I said, 6 through 10 to me is kind of just a coin flip because all of them are pretty even. I honestly think Toronto probably should be ahead of LAG and maybe even Minnesota, but the fact that they dropped methods pissed me off, so I put them at 10 for now. Um, then kind of some closing thoughts here. This podcast has been going on for a while. I feel like it's a pretty good length. Um, some closing thoughts here. Uh, first thing, I honestly kind of hated the drawn-out best of nine final. Uh, it got boring really fast. Uh, when we could see like that phase was just had an inevitable domination um, happening over Empire. 
I think they should just return to two best of fives, in my opinion, uh, because that's just more entertaining. Like, if FaZe is going to absolutely dominate like they did, at least it's over in three maps. They're going to 3 them and get them off the stage because they don't belong on the stage with FaZe. Um, but if Empire were actually going to make it competitive and, like, win that first best of five, like 3-2, that'd be exciting because it's a map five. And then you're really excited for that second one because Empire had showed they could beat them. Um, so it actually makes that second best of five really exciting. But instead, when we painfully watch FaZe go up 3-0 and they're just dominating them, it's like... And then, like... We had to watch seven maps because Empire were pesky enough to like scrape out two maps. It's just like we could all see after the 3-0 that happened in Winners Finals and then they were up like 3-0 in the final. We could all see the writing on the wall that FaZe was going to win this one way or another despite if Empire was able to like scratch out a map or two or something. I just think the two best of fives makes it more exciting because that way if FaZe is going to do dominate like they did, it's over in three maps. It's done. We don't have to like watch some boring beat down. But if Empire are able to be competitive they're going to make the first series 3-2 and then at least it's exciting or if they win that it makes everybody really excited for that second part of the series so like you may end up playing 10 maps which is more than nine obviously but at least like once you get through five maps if empire was able to win that first best of five it's actually exciting because you're like oh my god empire beat them in a best of five they reset the bracket like they have a chance to do this it's just more exciting when it's two best of fives i just think the best of nine has got to go because I sat around watching that, and I just watched it because I wanted to have information for the podcast, but my God, was it boring. I mean, we could tell from the get-go that Atlanta was going to win that. We just had to sit there and watch seven painful maps because Empire was pesky enough to take two. Um, then another little throw-in kind of closing thought here. Miles is the best. I love Maven and Merc. They're awesome. Still probably the best casting duo overall, but man, Miles is just so damn good at what he does. Uh, I got to give him a shout-out, a little credit for that. I'm worried he has a little bit too much star power and is too good, though, and might lead to do bigger and better things. I sure hope not. Obviously, I don't hope his career gets held back if he has bigger opportunities because I'd love to see anybody thrive. Um, but I hope I hope he doesn't leave uh, COD kind of like Courage left to be a star, which I can't blame Courage for that because, obviously, if you could leave and um, I mean, blow up your earnings and your career by, I mean, I probably over 100 times uh, is what Courage did from going from the money he made casting to his insane star power he has on like YouTube and streaming and stuff. If anybody can do that, you cannot fault them for doing it. Uh, so, I mean, if Miles is able to do something like that, obviously shout out to him, but I really don't want him to leave because he is so damn good. Just his wordplay and casting, he's just an awesome caster. I'm sure you all feel the same way. I just wanted to give a shout out to Miles because he's an awesome caster. Um, but yeah. I think that is going to do it for this episode. Please be sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed this podcast. I really enjoy doing this one a lot. Uh, we're on the road to 300 subs now, so if you guys could help me um, help us in our community achieve that goal, that would be awesome. Uh, obviously, I started out with the goal, like I've said a bunch of times, start out with the goal to get maybe a couple subs to just talk to competitive COD with, and now we're over 200, so it's just awesome to see. Um, so yeah, maybe we can start the road to 300. You guys could help me out with that. I would really appreciate it. Comment down below your power rankings, your regular season, and your major MVP, um, and just your overall thoughts on the method situation and just the league in general, the GAs and everything. I'd love to hear all your thoughts. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. Sorry for the delay in the video. Obviously, it's Wednesday. Hopefully, I can get this uploaded. I'm recording this like Wednesday afternoon. Hopefully, it's uploaded by the night. It kind of takes a while sometimes. Um, but sorry for the delay in the video. I love you guys. Uh, I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace out, everyone. Have a great day, and thanks for watching.